want to welcome you to our first class on Church in Ginger. And this, my name is Benjamin Williams. I'm the senior minister for the Central Church of Christ in Ada, Oklahoma. And I've developed this set of classes. Uh, I've used similar material at other places, but I, I've developed this specifically here for our church in Ada. But I know other people may view it, and we welcome you to the study and hope you get some benefit from it, whether you're doing it as a small group or individually or whatever format you choose to engage in. Uh, today's question of church and gender begins with a rudimentary question, which turns out to have a complicated answer, mostly because we've made it very complicated. And that question is, what is gender and what is equality? Uh, those are the two words that are really going to play largely into our discussion as we go forward in future lessons, uh, because if we don't know what those mean, then we can't get very far in talking about something like gender equality. Uh, we're going to need both of those terms to be at least reasonably well-defined and hopefully biblically defined. Or if we can't define them, at least we need to know what it is we don't know about them. So starting off with what is gender, uh, let me start out with maybe a, a secular definition, and I, I want to begin there. Uh, simply because I, I feel like we're going to have to engage the world we live in and how it's talking about gender right now, and it may be differently than you anticipate. So, uh, for example, if you look up the definitions of gender, you may get a chart something like this one. Uh, I've seen variations of it, but it's usually kind of the same thing. And it identifies the terms we usually talk about with gender in, in four different categories. The first is gender expression, which is the way a person communicates their gender identity to others uh, by how they dress, by how they act, or how they refer to themselves. Uh, that, that set of behavior is an expression of gender. Uh, gender identity is defined as, uh, the arrow's pointing to the brain on the picture, it's the person's own internal sense of being a man or being a woman or anything in between or, or you know, category three, whatever that is, okay? Um, orientation and attraction describes uh, the romantic or sexual feelings a person may have and whether they're towards persons of the same gender, persons of opposite gender, both, neither. Uh, that falls into the category of sexual attraction. And then finally, the one that you might have thought of first, uh, the word sex, or gender, we usually use them interchangeably in this discussion. Uh, sex usually refers to the labels male and female, or in, in modern culture, intersex, uh, given to someone at birth based on their body parts, on their human anatomy. Okay, So that's a pretty wide-ranging set of definitions in the culture we, we live in to kind of navigate. Um, furthermore, we know in a healthy person, or we think we know, <laughs> in a healthy person, these elements align and agree with each other. Now, that, would, that would be ideal. If you're psychologically healthy, physically healthy, then in theory, your identity, your expression, your biological sex, and your attraction, I, I think it's fair to say we, we want them to line up. If, if there's elements of your person, of your uh, nature, that aren't in alignment, well, that's, that's very distressing to you as a person. You're going to want counseling, or you're going to want to change that in some way. And so alignment would be a good thing when it comes to gender and sexuality in a person, uh, whereas being out of alignment is a very disturbing situation to find yourself in. Uh, the term for this is often gender dysphoria. It refers to experiences of gender identity in which a person's sense of gender identity does not align with one's biological or assigned sex. Um, so that if you're reading up, picking up a modern textbook on gender, this is the kind of terminology you're going to get. And there's obviously different options people turn to to kind of resolve that tension when it comes to gender. Uh, some are going to want to talk about uh, getting counseling to change their perception of themselves. Some will say, I'm going to get a, a medical procedure done to change my anatomy to match my internal sense of gender. Um, I say all that to say... And if your sense of what gender and sexuality are, are are pretty binary, like I'll admit mine are, um, it's a strange time for you to be alive and recognize that it's it's just a different discussion today than you might have signed up for when you were thinking about being a human. Um, for the purposes of this study, 
that's the last I'm going to say about that entire category of discussion. It's, it's interesting, and I'd be happy if at some point later we want to do a class specifically on those different elements of gender and whether they have uh, any biblical purchase, whether we should be concerned about them, what, what they mean. Uh, but for this study we're doing, that's not the kind of gender questions we're talking about. Uh, these diverse understandings of gender create for us, in today's topic, more confusion rather than clarity. Um, we will assume a, a fairly simple definition of gender, which I think we can see is implicit in the book of Genesis. And we're just going to run with that for the remainder of this class. Again, I, that's, wanted you, I wanted you to know I'm aware of the rest of that conversation. I know it's there, and it's good to have it, but that's just not this class. So what's a biblical view of gender that might come implicit in the book of Genesis? Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, uh, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the flesh, or the, excuse me, the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So in the ending of that text, you get a couple of, fairly straightforward observations we can make. First of all, humans overall, setting gender aside for a second, are created beings, not sovereign beings. And what I mean by that is God is a sovereign being. It, he doesn't have to ask anyone's permission to be who he is. He is what, whatever and whoever he is, and I get no say in it. Okay? Humans, on the other hand, are created beings which means that someone else does get a say in who I am, namely the creator. I didn't bring myself into existence. I have not always existed. So who and what I am is dependent, dependent right from the outset on someone else, on, in this case, the person who created me. And that changes a lot of how we think about ourselves. Uh, additionally, we can say humans are image-bearing creatures, not image-choosing creatures. By that we mean not only are we created, but we were created in a certain fashion, a certain image. God made us to be something. And in the process of making us to bear an image, to have impressed upon us a, a work of God's art, that means we didn't get to choose entirely what I would be. I know good old American Western culture says, you know, I'm, I am what I am and I'm going to choose what I am and I get saying everything about me. Uh, Sorry, false. You don't get say in everything you are. There are a lot of things about you that are just outside your control. Uh, as humans, there, there's some programming uh, that comes with the hardware. When you're born, there's some of it set. Now, you get some choices. I'm a free will guy. I believe you get a lot of choices along the way. But at the end of the day, you don't get ultimate say on what you were made to be. You bear the image of God. You didn't get to choose the image you wanted to have. Okay. Uh, Next, we could say humans are purpose-given creatures, not purpose-choosing creatures. And there again, kind of the same philosophy I'm pointing at in all of this is that the creature Adam and Eve in this story, the human, is given a purpose. God says, I will give them dominion, uh, which kind of in this text means something like stewardship over the creation. Uh, they're going to have a job to do, and I'm going to set them to it. That is their purpose. And then he says they're going to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, That's a purpose that humanity has been given that we didn't actually get to say it. In the Genesis account, that's just something handed to us. Uh, that's very different, again, from modern culture, Western culture, American culture, where everything is individual. Everything is about personal choice. And the fact is, biblically speaking, personal choice is definitely downplayed in the opening chapter of Genesis. Uh, you're given a purpose. You don't get to pick the meaning of your life. The meaning of your life has been handed to you in one sense uh, by the creator. He gets dibs on who you're going to be in, in that sense. And then to our question specifically, as we get to the question of gender, uh, in this text, God created two human genders. Uh, and that's all you're ever going to get out of Genesis 1. Uh, there's Lots of very interesting discussions, as I alluded to earlier, about alternatives and other options, and I think those are interesting, um, but ultimately they don't change the basic sense of the Genesis account that in, in the creation in its initial state, um, there, God ordained that there would be two genders. Genesis 1.28 said, God blessed them and said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Uh, in this text, we notice that gender and sexuality have a practical purpose apart from self-actualization. That it's not the same as um, my gender exists simply to bring me identity and satisfaction. Gender is part of my identity. Gender may be part of how I find satisfaction, but that's not its purpose. The practical purpose of gender is to continue the human species. Um, and, and that is significant. So many of modern discussions about gender just cut that out. In, in a sense, I understand why, that you're not obligated to have kids if you're human. There are lots of people who don't have kids, and that's fine. I don't think the Bible says that's a problem. But what we do notice is if you start consistently talking about gender in a way that ignores that more practical element of this is what gender was created to permit and create and endorse, uh, then, then we lose track of what gender is about. Genesis 2, 7, and also 21 to 23. This is the kind of further account of the creation in chapter 2. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And of the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this, is, uh, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Uh, gender, as with all human existence, generally speaking, it has an inescapably physical component. Um, and what I mean by that is you're not Casper the ghost. You're not kind of a fuzzy ball of light floating through space. You are a body in this place and time and this location. Okay. And that matters. That is the shape God gave you and made you to be. I think we get it in our head, especially as Christians, that this is all about like saving my soul. And, and then it flies away off somewhere. Um, I don't want to downplay the significance of the spiritual component of humanity. That's certainly part of who we are, and it's part of the story. But in the beginning, God created out of dust, out of material substance, a human being, uh, out of Adam's rib, as the story goes. And we can have all kinds of questions about what that means. But out of material substance, God made material beings. And so uh, I mention that because, again, that tells me something about who I am. Um, I'm not some brain in a vat that's just kind of floating around, disconnected from my body. My body is part of who I am, and I have to kind of come to grips with what that means. Genesis chapter 3 describes the fall of mankind, as it's commonly described. And um, in that story, let me just summarize quickly, uh, the serpent comes into the story and deceives first the woman, and then uh, Adam is subsequently deceived, and or at least willfully sins, we could say. And so there's sin that takes place, a defiance of God's will. And so in that chapter, God describes in chapter 3 the consequence of that sin, of that rebellion against God's created will. So in describing the consequence in Genesis 3, 16 and following, it says, To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. What I mentioned there that I think is significant, uh, first of all, a word to the, the casual Christian reader. Do not read the text in Genesis 3 and verse 16 where it talks about the man ruling over woman as if that's what God wanted. This is a consequence of sin. What God wanted is in Genesis 1 and 2. What happened because of sin begins in chapter 3. And in chapter 3, it says, as a consequence of sin. I don't think it's a penalty, like God arbitrarily said, now you got to do 30 push-ups, and oh no, yeah, man will rule over you. I don't think that's it at all. But as a consequence, that sin has entered in and corrupted the world and human society, um, the relationship between man and woman and their role in the created order was, 
broken and damaged in some way. Uh, and I think we can notice this in the details of the story. The two genders engage in and suffer from sin differently, suggesting, I think, a different psychology and spirituality for each of them. Specifically, that phrase we might have to look at in verse 16, uh, where it says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, he shall rule over you. Um, other translations, which I think are actually better, your desire shall be for your husband, he shall rule over you. And what I think is going on there is that God is saying this relationship between man and woman, in this case a husband and wife, is always going to be damaged because of the fact that sin's in the world. Have you noticed that relationships are hard? That romantic relationships are difficult to sustain? If God made us for each other, why are relationships so difficult? Well, it's because sin has entered the world and damaged those at a very rudimentary, deep down in the human heart kind of level. And human psychology and spirituality have been tainted, poisoned at the well, as it were, because of sin. Uh, so women, I think if you read this text, your desire will be for your husband, I think is a description for, of the fact that so often women find it difficult or impossible to find their meaning and purpose and identity in life, God-given purpose and identity, apart from a man. Uh, quite often they turn to a man and define themselves in the terms of that person. Uh, they don't feel like they can have peace and safety without that person. Uh, an example that I, I repeat quite often, I used to be uh, with a church that was involved deeply in prison ministry, and the prison minister would often lament the, the sad fact that he would go into a women's prison and do uh, life-changing work, and these women would be very serious about understanding the mistakes that brought them there and not repeating those choices, and they're going to have a new life behavior uh, when they got out. And then it seemed like invariably they would go get out of prison, move back in with the same scumbag boyfriend, do something illegal, and end back up in prison or beaten to death. I mean, those were the, the consequences that, of their choice. Tragic, right? But it, it tells something about the human condition a little bit, that there is a tendency among women to identify themselves entirely in some man, even if it's a destructive identity. I think you get that in John chapter 4, the story of the woman of the well who had multiple husbands. Uh, here's a person who just keeps looking for contentment in a man, and a man can't give it to you. Right? That's something you find in God. You can't find it, but she keeps looking. Okay. Meanwhile, a husband, a man, tends to find his meaning and identity and value in domination and power. He's going to rule over you is not a statement of, and that's what I want. It's a statement of, here's the sad consequence of sin. Uh, he was created first, and that means something, but now because of sin, it means something very different, that his relationship to woman is going to be, as history has shown us, so often one of abuse, of domination, of control, of manipulation, and men seem to think that makes them better men. Well, it makes us lesser men, um, but that, again, is the consequence of sin, and it's different for each gender. That's, that's a big point there, is that Gender engages in and suffers from sin differently. We're not exactly the same. We share a common humanity, both made in the image of God, but there is also something that's different about us. We're not exactly the same, and that's something we see in the way that we sin and have sinned historically. So that gives us, I hope, kind of a ballpark idea of what gender is in the biblical sense, uh, kind of how to think about it and how we're going to discuss it in this class. Uh, the other word I want to take a swing at and just attempt to define in some way is the word equality. It is a very difficult word to define, and you're laughing at me right now saying, I mean, equality is an easy word. <laughs> two plus two equals four. That's easy, right? No. <laughs> equality is a very difficult word to define. And, and let me just give you an example, very simple case, where I think I can prove to you without a doubt uh, why equality is difficult. Am I, Benjamin J. Williams, equal to LeBron James? Okay, think about that really hard, right? Am I equal to LeBron James? Okay, so you know 
that the answer to that question is entirely dependent on what you mean when you said equal. Okay? We are equal under law. We are equal as image-bearing creatures. We are not equal on the basketball court. We are not equal in the bank account. We are not equal in a variety of ways, right? Uh, so what do we mean by equal? Well, there isn't one definition. That's the problem. So I'm just going to point out today that this word can mean so many things. We really do have to be more narrowly focused on what we mean by it. We might mean identical. Four equals four. And by that, we mean they are exactly the same. There is no difference whatsoever between four and four. <laughs> four is four. In fancy terms, that's called a tautology where you say, this is this, I mean, it's what it is. <laughs> it's just what it is. Uh, but also another sense of equality might be interchangeability. Two plus two equals four isn't the same as four equals four, right? Two and two are both numbers. There's a mathematical operator in there. I know we're talking math and that's terrible, right? But there's, there's a couple of terms there being added and they have the numerical value that is equal to four. But two isn't equal to four, and two isn't equal to four, and the plus sign isn't equal to four. Uh, but there's something about that expression. Two plus two is interchangeable with four. Anywhere in any equation, you see the number four, you can put two plus two there and it'll be fine. And anywhere you see two plus two, you can put four there and you'll be fine. General terms. Um, we also might use the word equal to mean synonymous or meaning basically the same thing. Uh, I could say you're a quiet person. I could say you're a shy person. Those two words mean kind of equally the same, but not exactly, right? They can mean the same, but a quiet person might be very outgoing, just soft of voice, and a shy person might be really loud when they finally talk, okay? So they don't mean exactly the same thing, but they, they mean some related things, and so that's a kind of equality. Uh, sometimes we mean equality by, we just mean united or cooperating even. When we talk about the United States, well, the states, in the sense that their states have some equality between them, but Texas and Oklahoma aren't the same in, in any measurable metric, right? The population, gross, uh, gross income, you know, whatever you want it to be, uh, none of those things are the same, uh, but they cooperate. As, as states, they have equal opportunities as states, you might think, under the Constitution. Coworkers, the same way. People have different jobs in a business, so they're equal in one sense and not in another. They're united or they're cooperating, uh, but they may not have the same role in the organization. Um, when we talk about equality in society, a lot of times we'll talk about legal equality, which means they're the same under law. So here's a good example where just, because gender wasn't a controversial enough topic, I'll talk about race for just a second. When we talk about racial equality in the country, a lot of times people aren't using that word in the same way. Some people say, well, we have racial equality, and what they mean is legal equality. According to the Constitution, an American citizen is an American citizen, the end, full stop. Uh, and citizenship can't be denied or abrogated based on racial distinctions. So in a sense, in, in the letter of the law, absolute equality has been obtained. There's legal equality. We don't have one set of laws for people of color and another set of laws for people who look like me, in principle. So legal equality, well, we, we probably have quite a lot of that. Social equality is something different. Social equality is, do people have the same status or opportunities? That one's a little more tricky to understand. In some circumstances, uh, yes, um, a person of color and a person who looks like me can both go into Walmart, right? I mean, there's not a, a, a whites-only Walmart and a, a, you know, different variations of that, right? So in some sense, okay, we have some social equality, and that's good. Um, but in other areas, it seems as though some people don't have the same opportunity or access to opportunity that others do. And so there, there's that kind of inequality. Even though the law has a statement of equality, you may not have social equality. And that's, that's where a lot of the debate is happening today, is to what degree are we required by morality to ensure social equality? And that's, that's a good question. Not today's question, but it's a good example of how equality 
gets up and moves around on you as a word, as one of my professors used to say. Um, and then final definition, which would make this even more difficult, is outcome equality. Uh, some would say we don't have equality in society until everyone has the same results. Uh, that one's a little more challenging. In principle, you understand why it makes sense. Um, if men and women, let's, let's say, let's take a job like, uh, I don't know, bank president. If 70% of bank presidents in America are men, I don't know if that's true, I'm just completely making that up. Um, it could be that that shows us there's some kind of social inequality where women weren't given the same kind of equality at the social level, opportunity, access, maybe it's education or whatever it is. Um, maybe that's the problem. So outcome inequality, things not working out the way that we think they should, 50-50, uh, might tell us something. However, there's other categories where we'd say, eh, I'm not sure we want outcome equality. Um, I was reading statistic the other day. Uh, I'm going to probably get it wrong, but I think it was 85% of OBGYNs are currently women, which is up from you know, nearly none several decades ago. Uh, well, the fact that we have Let's, let's say it is 85, I hope I got that right. 85% of OBGYNs are women currently. I don't know of anyone who wants to correct that and say, well, we gotta have 50-50 or there's a problem. We need to get more men in there, right? I mean, that, that, we'd say, oh, it's okay, we think, for some circumstances, for a group of people to have um, more interest in a field, maybe, we don't know. Um, likewise, in the construction field, Upwards of 90% of all people involved in the construction industry are men. And if you get out of the administrative part of it and down to like the bricklayer level, it's like 99.9% .9 of construction workers are men. And I don't know of anybody who's saying we, we need to level that. We need complete 100% 50-50 split outcome equality. We need the same number of men and women laying bricks. Um, so I, I think you get my point that that one is trickier to say, what are, what are we actually asking for? Uh, there's a great short story from years gone by by Kurt Vonnegut uh, titled Harrison Bergeron. And it's a story of a world of handicaps where they were so committed to equality that they would, you know, make make fast people wear weights so they couldn't go as far and as fast and, and slow people down. Like anyone who had any exceptional ability, we had to make sure they didn't so everyone could be equal. And I think most of us say, well, that's that's not a kind of equality we would want. So my point is equality, when you say we want equality, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Christians know this firsthand if you do any Christian theology. Um, the doctrine of the Trinity is an especially difficult place to use the word equality. We know it works and yet it's also complicated. This statement on the screen is from the Athanasian Creed and it says, we worship one God in Trinity, the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. The classic Christian definition of the Trinity says that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal in glory and majesty. But they're not exactly the same. The Son isn't the same person as the Father, and the Holy Spirit isn't the same person as the Son, and so forth. And so in that example, we know the word equality is difficult to define. Some people have tried to use that analogy and say, now that tells us something about gender. I find that to be very difficult because it's so hard to explain anyway. <laughs> Why take something complicated and use that to explain something that we don't understand? Uh, so I would just say, leave that one alone. But my point is, yeah, the word equality in different contexts is, is very difficult to nail down. All that to say this, we define gender as male and female. Um, when we make the statement, men and women are equal, that is a fundamentally true statement. If you're a Christian person, a Bible-believing Christian, you are committed to that principle. They are both image-bearing creatures of God, and they are equal catch is not everyone who says that is going to mean the same thing. So in this class, one of the, the subjects kind of in the background of the whole discussion is the issue of what do we mean when we say equal? 
and how does that play out in the life of the church? I know this was a little bit dense as a lesson, a whole lot of information flying around, but that's how the introductions are. Uh, I had to get those definitions out of the way. Uh, but stay tuned for future lessons, and hopefully we'll get to the nuts and bolts of what we should think about those genders as they work together in God's kingdom.